Hello, and thank you for coming to our presentation. Uh, thank you also. We greatly appreciate everyone sticking out to the very end uh, for the last presentations. We are going to be giving three separate presentations in this session, and it's all on refactoring. We would like to share our experiences and sort of real world experiences in doing this. Um, hopefully, we have a screen for the most of it. So, my name is uh, Christopher Field. I am the principal developer and president at Field R&D Services. I've been using LabVIEW since version 7.3, so what, 2005. So, almost 15 years now, and during that time, I've done everything from scientific instrumentation, development, design, deployment, and verification, to building a Roomba for the inside of a nuclear reactor. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming again. My name is Cesar Teixeira. I'm a project manager and software architect in Blue Eye Systems in Brazil. I have been using LabVIEW for five years. And I'm a certified LabVIEW architect and a certified test 10 developer as a certified professional instructor. Hi, my name is Oliver Wachnow. I'm coming from Germany working as a CCT coach engineering consultant, more or less uh, yeah, product engineering support. Uh, in a company called Burkhardt in Germany, We're producing valves and electronics, so process control equipment. <coughs> and in my free time, so at nights, uh, I'm running a little consulting business at the site in trains for an eye and do consulting gigs. And um, just like Christopher said, we have uh, split this presentation into three, so uh, the three of us will just uh, switch over the microphones and if it's possible, we will ask you to, to uh, keep your questions until the end. So uh, we don't know how good we are about the time. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so today I'm going to talk about sort of refactoring at the block diagram level. This is going to use some existing LabVIEW features, um, like a diagram disabled structure and bookmarks, in the combination with a series of conventions to be efficiently refactored at the block diagram level. And maybe we'll see some zombies through the process. So I'm going to start off talking about what is refactoring, for those that don't necessarily know, just to give a brief background on that, why you would want to do that, the scope of refactoring in a larger and small project, and how we, the three of us, have sort of divided that up. And then um, go into sort of my specific case, which is inspired by another talk that I saw many years ago. And what we'll then do is go through an example of refactoring on the block diagram. We'll inherit some code. We'll do some excavation on that code to figure out what's going on with it. We'll use our newfound powers of necromancy to possibly battle an army of undead code. And then we'll send our old code off on a nice funeral at the end. So all of this kind of revolves around this, uh, this comic, which some of you may have seen before, and it's all this sort of thing, what is good code, and it's all sort of subjective. And refactoring is an iterative process by which we're going to hopefully eventually maybe get this unattainable goal of good code. So what is refactoring? Well, in a very short sentence, it's basically changing portions of an existing code base without changing its behavior. Now we all do this implicitly as we're writing our code. You start off with a blank screen, a blank block diagram, you start dropping things on there, you start putting in your implementation, and you say, you take a step back and you're like, eh, this doesn't look right, or maybe I need to change some things. And so you just do this naturally, it's an iterative process. But it could also be an explicit thing as part of your workflow, as part of your software development practice with a team. And this could be a code review, and this could be something you do at the end of a deployment to say, how can we have done this better? How can we make this easier? How can we make it perform better? Maybe make it scale better? So on and so forth. Also, refactoring can kind of be sort of summed up with these two uh, quotes. The top one, some of you may have seen before, it's often used in software development. Basically, how do you know when you're done, when you can't remove anything else from the project? And so you're trying to go to a simpler code. You're trying to make it easier and simpler. The other one is uh, by a book on refactoring. And basically what we're trying to do is if we make a habit of this, either implicitly or explicitly, we will eventually obtain good code, something that's easy to extend and easy to maintain. So other reasons you'd want to refactor include, for example, like future proofing which means in the future you're going to inherit your own code and you want to extend and add new features to it. You may also want to make it faster to fix bugs. We are all going to introduce bugs into our software. It's inevitable, it's going to happen, but we should at least do everything in our power to reduce the number of bugs but make it easier to resolve them later on in the future. 
Other reasons include, for example, uh, you have new team members, you're working on a larger team or you have a larger project, you want a decreasing amount of time it takes for them to become familiar with it so they can become uh, productive. And also there's a technical support sort of uh, aspect to this where if you're constantly going to your code to answer questions by your customers or your clients, you want to make that fast and efficient as well. And then there's also, you as the developer, you're continuously evolving. We're all here this week to learn, to create our new styles, to evolve, to educate ourselves. And if we can do this over time with all of our code, we eventually get to that good code aspect. Now, the one point to make here though is that we're not changing the code for sake of change. It's not like, oh, I have an afternoon free, I wanna build some time to my client, I'm gonna make some changes to some code. The whole point is to do this towards a direction that it's making it easier to maintain, extend, and use in the future. So this led to a discussion among the three of us a little bit on scope and how we're gonna structure this uh, session and this presentation. We defined refactoring on scope in sort of three sections. There's me, and I'm gonna talk about the VI and on the block diagram. This is sort of at the implementation level or your algorithm. Caesar's gonna talk about sort of a library then. So when you have a grouping of VIs, how do you refactor that to maintain behavior but make it easier to maintain? And then Ollie is gonna show a full size application that he's been in the works um, to refactor the entire thing. Now, I'd also wanna make just a brief mention about inheritance because if you've gone to any of the object-oriented programming stuff, inheritance is mentioned quite often. That's not the inheritance we're talking about here. Inheritance for us in this presentation is some code is created, some time has passed, and you share it with somebody else. They have inherited your code in this case. So it is more about sort of the sharing as opposed to any sort of uh, architecture or design in that case. All right, so now we kind of go into the inspiration for my talk and also for some of the uh, conventions and behaviors that I've come up with to refactor your code at the block diagram level. So back in 2014, I saw this uh, YouTube video and he presented this library in PHP for this dynamic web application where he had this problem of code that he didn't know if it was running or not. And he didn't know if he could remove it or not. And so he was trying to clean up his project and what I took away from that project were these three sort of bullet points that he kind of made. It's a very short talk, it's only like five minutes, it's even fa he talks even faster than I do. Um, but there's a lot of great ideas in there. And one of the things is, is their code should never just blindly be removed. And we're all engineers and scientists, we're all looking at data, we're all trying to have evidence to do whatever we're doing. And so what we really wanna do is we should apply that to our software as well. We should have evidence or data to support the removal of our code. Because if we remove, the, if we just go through and blindly remove code, we introduce bugs and we lose behavior, which is one of the things we don't wanna do when we're factoring uh, our software. The other thing was is he introduced this idea of timestamps and usernames and it's an excellent convention and very quick and easy way to get that evidence and to provide that data to do the refactoring. And then another bullet point I took from that was uh, if we can automate all this it makes it all easier to do the refactoring and you can make it a habit and you can eventually get to that goal of clean code. I want to mention this is not a direct <coughs> implementation of his talk or his library or any uh, necessarily even of everything he was talking about because that was a PHP application as a web application, not quite the same realm. Um, so what I've mostly have done is used it as inspiration, taking some of the naming, namings, some of the theming, and then also extended it for lab view usage. All right, so let's go ahead and let's inherit some code. Uh, I, so here we have a block diagram. And what we immediately see is there's some, possibly some ugliness down here. It's a little busy. We've got only one loop in there. We know there's some kind of behavior is gonna have a prompt that will uh, push up there. And we've got something that deals with time and date, which is sometimes um, kind of hairy to deal with. So here are the three steps for refactoring this code. Step one, select all. Step two, delete. Step three, which is optional put a to-do on there. So, because look what we have. We have a beautiful, clean block diagram. It'd be even cleaner if we got rid of the to-do there. And it still runs, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> we've refactored our code. But what we've noticed, though, is that we've lost some behavior. We no longer have that prompt coming up. So we're not actually doing refactoring. 
The other thing is, is we've lost two important things. One is that behavior, and the second one is, what happened? Where's my implementation? Where's my old code? Your old code is the best code you've written since writing this code. It's also the most tested. This code could have been 10 years old. It could have been running on multiple architectures. It could have been used by multiple users. You've got all the bugs fixed out of it. What you've just done when you deleted everything is you've lost all of that history, and you've lost the implementation. Because what happens after you do that delete all? The next thing that happens, you get a phone call. Oh, you get an email. Oh, I gotta go to the water cooler. Oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Six months later, you come back. Okay, now what am I supposed to do? Right? And if you're using version control, obviously you can revert back and take a look at it, but maybe you're not. So you're left with this blank diagram. There's a better way. Right? Let's go back and let's look at our original block diagram. And we want, what we really want to do is we want to keep this sort of implementation around because it's our most tested code out there and also use it as a reference of its implementation. And what we really want, though, is a safe place in which we can make these changes, but still keep the implementation around. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide and conquer. And I look at this part here, and I see that this is something that we could possibly refactor into a sub DI. There's something going on with time and date. I don't know what the percent A does. I'd have to go look it up in the documentation, but it has something to do with Tuesdays. There's a clear defined sort of input that will occur and an output that will occur. So we can make sure that we can refactor that and keep that uh, functionality around, that behavior around. So what I'll do next is we're going to wrap that in a diagram disabled structure. And then we're going to implement some conventions. We're going to create a safe place in which to make these changes, but keep the reference around, keep the implementation there. So if we look at this a little bit closer, I call it a grave site because what I have is a tombstone. I have the date that I created the uh, diagram disabled structure, and I have the person that dug the grave. Now this is not necessarily to blame the person later on for doing this, it's just to provide that evidence and that data. So this is the date that the old code died, we put it into the corpse case, and we want to keep the spirit, the behavior of it around, so we copy and paste it into the enabled part of our sub, of our diagram disabled structure, and this allows us to make an implementation and reference back to the original one whenever we want. So now what we can do is put this code into a sub DI. And we see we have our safe place, we maintain our inputs and outputs, we maintain our behavior on there. We know when we created this, providing that data, we know who did that. So now we've refactored into that sub VI. We've done some refactoring and we've used some natural conventions. Now it's 2 a.m., you get a phone call, it's your boss. This code that's been running for 10 years without a problem is now has a problem. Anytime you touch the code, you risk introducing new bugs into it. And it turns out that we've done that. Well, we've, by using this convention and using a sub, uh, this diagram disabled structure, we have a way to fix this real quickly and buy ourselves some time. We can now use our abilities of necromancy and we can raise the dead. So when you raise the dead, so if something was dead and now is alive, that is called a zombie. So instead of a corpse, we have a zombie in our block diagram. When we use the bookmark, we call it a zombie, we have our rebirth day of the uh, zombie, and we have the person, the necromancer, who revived that old code. This again provides us data in the future to decide when it's appropriate to remove this code, because eventually we do want to get rid of this entire thing here and just have that sub DI in there instead. But for the time being, it's two o'clock in the morning, I really just want to go back to sleep, and I want my boss to stop calling me in the middle of the night with problems. This buys us time to do that. If we look at this a little bit closer, we do an autopsy on our zombie, we see that we just all we've really done is disabled our spirit case, and we've kept that around so we can go back to that later, and we have then our old code has just been reanimated, more or less. So now that buys us time to go into the sub VI, and we see that what happened was, when we created that and did some refactoring, we introduced a bug. It appears that the cat walked across the keyboard and introduced that. Most of my bugs are from cats walking across keyboards. So we can go back in and we can fix the Tuesday and make it just Tuesday. And now we are pretty confident that this code is going to work. It looks like the original reference implementation. So we can go back to our code. And what we want to do now 
is we want to battle that undead. We have this zombie walking around in our block diagram. So ultimately, we want to smite it with our Righteous Fury and get rid of it from there. And all that simply does is we enable the Spirit Diagram and disable the Zombie Diagram. So if we look at this, we still keep this around. We still have our timestamp and our bookmark there because that's going to provide us evidence later on on how to on when it is appropriate to remove this code. And then we have just this enabled. So everything kind of stays the same in our battle with the zombie. So now, let's say it's been, let's fast forward several months. This code's been running just fine. We're getting the prompts when we're supposed to get them. I haven't had any late night phone calls yet. It is time now to send that old code on its way, have a nice funeral for it, and leave behind just the sub VI. Because we notice here that this is providing some visual noise to our block diagram. So we're going to have it. We're going to bury that corpse, that zombie. And now we've done our refactoring. We have some very nice, clean, self-documented block diagram. We now know exactly what that code does. We don't have to look at the implementation. It's been running and tested. And we know that that has something to do with uh, having to say, is it Tuesday or not? So this is a series of steps and conventions when we combine them together with native LabVIEW uh, features, it makes it really easy and powerful to uh, refactor your block diagram. Because one of the things we can do with the, sub, uh, with the diagram disabled structure in these grave sites is we can nest them. Right? So we can put them all in there. We have different stages of refactoring of the entire block diagram. This also provides a very clear way of sort of saying what are the different parts of divide and conquer that I need to do in order to make this easier. Now, in addition to this, with this nesting feature, we also have been using these bookmarks. So what does this allow us to do is use the bookmark manager, and it gives us a very nice list automatically. This is all free, it's all built into LabVIEW right off the bat, just using some very simple conventions, and we get a nice track of our refactoring project. And this can also happen across an entire project or a couple VIs or any VI that's open and using these bookmarks. <coughs> this is great. It can get better because in LabVIEW 2015, you're able to make your own bookmark managers. So, what I've created is, if you have a collection of grave sites, you of course have a graveyard. And I've color coordinated them so I can see exactly where all of my zombies are in my code. I've also added in a bunch of uh, actions that allows me to track my refactoring, provide the data that tells me when I can refactor them, and I can then hit the buttons to actually do all of this without ever leaving the bookmark manager. I can search for them through the graves, or I can look at them through zombies, and we can do all of this with just the native features of LabVIEW using some very simple conventions. Now that third bullet point in the, um, the talk that I took away uh, at the beginning for the inspiration was mentioning automation. I understand that it's difficult to type in those times, uh, time and date stamps and type in the names and all that sort of stuff. So I created a uh, add-on and toolkit that's freely available on the NI Tools Network called Eulogy so that you can use and practice all this stuff. And this exact example is also available in that project. So if you're wondering what the code does, I leave that to you to decide and go through it to figure out what it actually does. This also has a, a programming application interface so that you can integrate any of these conventions and these automations into your own builds or into your program review or code reviews if you're doing sort of an explicit refactoring project <coughs> along those lines. So that is refactoring at the block diagram level. I'm going to hand it off to Caesar now, who will talk about the next level or scope of refactoring. Hello again, everyone. My name is Cesar, and I will focus now at the architectural level. Okay. So I based my presentation in a real world case. This is a combustion chamber inside the university in Brazil. They have two different applications inside this lab. And what my company should do is put this, this both applications at the same application and refactor the whole LabVIEW system. So first of all, what is an API? It's a set of tools for building software applications, right? In LabVIEW, we have some options. So here, the architects develop the API. The API will be used to developer to achieve some code functionality. What we're going to do here is to know how to how to put your code together here and deliver for a developer or for yourself and achieve the same code functionality that your application used to have. Uh, how can we 
do that in LabVIEW. We have three options. We are going to focus on LabVIEW libraries here. I will not talk about instrument drivers or LLB. So why use an API to share and reuse code? It's very simple. First, you can share interface for multiple developers and achieve the same functionality. For example, the DocMX API. So if you have some functionalities, you can put them together, share with your developers, and achieve always the same result. Uh, you can split and high and low level tasks so you can choose whatever, what your developer will be able to see and what your developer will not be able to see because you are the architect behind the code. So you know what is better for them and for your framework. And you can select critical portions of logical behavior and applications to re reuse them in your architectural process. So let's focus now on low-level tasks. For example, in that's the re my real case, we have some non-NI instruments, and we have to create an API for them. So we create uh, I created low-level tasks for just my own, like close the bus communication, handle no errors, or open the bus communication, and set a simple task. For my developer, I just delivered acquire voltage, close instruments, and initialize instruments. Why I do that? Because I want to have the same behavior as I used to have before. So I encapsulated this inside the API and developer takes and give this to my developer so achieve the functionality. So here's the high level task. They will manage your large operations inside the API. So but how can I decide what my developer will or will not see? That's easy. We can change the access scope inside the API. A public scope will allow access outside the API. A private scope will limit the use of the API inside the API. So now we know what is an API. We know how to use it. We know how can we split it. So first of all, we have to identify critical logical behaviors inside our code. Then we divide in low and high level tasks. And remember, always start with the most cri critical requirements for your system. So here, for example, I have a user interface API. So here, I divided in low and high level tasks, delivered to my developer, and we achieve the same functionality as before. So we are, we, we, as I said, we, we use API to group critical functions. So here I have high level tasks, low level tasks. I have some queues and operations inside and this is the high level task. So the user will interact with this. My developer will interact with the high level tasks and I, the architect, will interact with low-level tasks. So we have four main usabilities for this. For refactory at the architectural level, the icons, organization, name, and place VI context. Today, we are going to focus on organization and naming, OK? So so now you're developing your API, you develop, you refactor your code, and now you have to set names. Names are important for your code. The name is the primary indicator of a functionality. So this name is good, voltage, I'm getting voltage for a hardware. I have a you know, his interface here, but this is better. I have an API to handle hardware abstraction layer for voltage acquisition. I, I have some user interface tools. So always remember to use the better, not the good option. This is another time, uh, another example of bad naming. So time, okay. This VI handle time. Which type of time? Seconds, milliseconds, hours. Now I know. This API will help me to handle 
time in seconds. Level, okay, level of what? Voltage level in millivolts. So this API is an API designed for acquired millivolts levels. So always remind to keep it simple, but remind that you guys have to increase usability with name. So avoid ambiguity. Voltage test. Voltage test. Voltage in, voltage out, voltage in test. Um, avoid reverse logic. So I see a lot of this stuff when I was in applications engineering inside national instruments. A lot of customers were doing this. They had a data logger operation and they reverse the logic. Well, they got a lot of reverse logic because just don't log data. It's better to you to save your code than you have to do with the thing. Not the opposite. Another important thing is to use rings and enums for self-documentation inputs. Controls names, even Boolean text, don't are considered self-documentation. But you can use enums and rings to provide self-documentation for an end in a connector. So this is a little bit of summary of what we learned. So use an API to group critical logical behavior on your application. Separate functions in high and low level tasks. Use access scopes to separate those tasks that only give access to high level tasks. Name your API with consistent names. Just meet their functionality through it. Use ring and anon for self-documentation and on high and low level tasks. Now Oliver will see. Actually, we're quite good on time. Fine. So I hope I can take I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. Just have to smile at the camera. Everybody knows I was here just to prove my wife I was in the summer. My part of this presentation is called guinea pigging myself. It's like this. Um, uh, one click further, please. Uh, this is basically a sequel to last year's presentation. Any sp anybody's been here, seen that one? So I know Chris is in the back who was sharing the presentation slot with me. Um, are you curious or just friendly? Um, I like seeing the various points of view from. Okay, it's so he's friendly. It's, it's a okay. <laughs> challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, uh, next one, please. So what, what last year's um, presentation was about was um, I had the honor of inheriting a student's project. Um, this what that was not really working. Um, the poor guy delivered something, but you see, there was no proper planning, no requirements and stuff. And this, this whole thing was doomed. It was, it, it yeah, had to fail. So, but anyway, I was given the code. Um, the code itself is a uh, instrument driver for a special can open dialect, and we needed to get that running for our own production and also for our first customers. So it was on me. So it was on me to do some magic to get something running. Yeah, and this was what came. This is what came out. Um, we were given a DLL by our R&D department which basically communicates with a with bus, with an internal name, bus, some fancy German acronym for something. Um, and this DLL has two ways of communication. It's either uh, normal function calls or callback functions, which in left you have to be mapped into dynamic user interfaces. So, and since I'm a strong believer in the actor framework still, yeah, um, I have taken the actor as my demon in the background. You will see the, the, the word demon somewhere there in the background. That really handles all of the asynchronous stuff that comes from the DLL and delivers delivers the data to a driver API. So the user does, at first glance, does not see there's an, an actor behind. But if he dives down, if he takes that stuff into his project, um, he sees that. Next slide, please. Um, 
And um, during the, pre the uh, preparation of last year's presentation, I was going like, hmm, the framework might be a little oversized. I don't need the inheritance. Um, I had some feedback from customers and from people in my organization that said, oh, I don't want to use the ECTO framework. Yeah, anyway, um, and during the, well, the presentation preparation, um, I just had the idea, why not just rip out the ECTO, which is oversized, and replace it with the DTMH module. So that was, and then interface to DLL is more or less the same. API could stay the same. Um, just rip that out and try that. And I wanted to give that a try. And yeah, this, this was, was uh, and that was my, uh, my last half year was about, because I had one year of time to try that, but since this is a pet project and I have to run that on the side, it's just, yeah. Okay, fast forward. Um, one click more please. Um, there was a to-do list. Those four points I have addressed during this re refactoring. So this is refactoring level two to, uh, to use Christopher's words. Um, pallet integration had not been uh, done. Um, terminal window, I'm not going to speak about that. We had terminal window popping up. Um, I wanted to reduce the number of available APIs for the user, so clean up the API. And it says even as a singleton, so the asynchronous module used that the actor use the DTMH. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. But at first, um, I wanted to come up with a suitable architecture for that. The existing version was a very flat structure. Um, just, you know, just putting the stuff into it and make making it work. Um, I wanted to go for something proper right now. So you know, the artifact patches somewhere over there. You have to do that for uh, have to do something for your um, for your type of No, um, what I did was to um, to instantiate a or to define a class, almost abstract class. I might call it. It's not purely an abstract class, which defines um, most of the methods and most of the data that's needed. And this class is. Uh, Using the open closed principle can be is extended by this class, which is called boost driver event. So it's the driver using the event. So this one is used to really call the DQMH modules. Because DQMH and its interface is not even uh, is not object based. Um, this is more or less it, this class is the wrapper for the. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah. Then, so I told you, uh, I want to reduce the number of available VIs. Why do I have so many available VIs? Those devices on the bus, on this can open bus. They can have data objects, U8, I8, U16, and so on, yeah? So it's 10 data types of objects, and each one of those 10 data types can be, each node can be addressed by name or by a node number, so it's, 20 VIs, yeah? having 20 VIs for read, for write, and for write and verify, so it's, we're, we're at 60 uh, VIs. The old driver, you have to na navigate between 60 VIs. This is something I did not want. So my goal was to um, yeah, to use polymorphic VIs, so the user can just like it, like use from DAC and X, just to have the uh, design, design, design experience. Um, what, uh, I wanted to use that. The problem was I found out that dynamic dispatch methods that I had to use there uh, can be used with polymorphic VIs. In hindsight, that's quite clear. Um, but nevertheless, at that moment, I was kind of, oh, shit, it's not going to happen. But I find out uh, you can really wrap dynamic dispatch VIs with, uh, with static dispatch VIs, and then you can make that stuff work. And the inheritance still works. but. Yeah. We had well, just talked about 60 VIs, and those 60 VIs had to be wrapped. So yay, finally, the opportunity to get into LabVIEW scripting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, I've always delayed and delayed and delayed, and this time I used it to, to have the boilerplate code, please. And 
you see that's um, that's the UML diagram, or that's part of the UML diagram, and the master class, the the, the, the parent class, looks quite what well, it is big. Yeah, it goes way down there. It's 60 accessor method, methods and some other stuff. Um, but I was able to really uh, strip down the implementation. That's why this is not really abstract. It has some functionality in there. Yeah? Um, strip down the implementation to a class like that. Uh, this has only 30 or 40, 40 or 40 methods. So this is part of the VI tree of the old driver. You can just ignore that red strike out. I put that in for this legacy code. Uh, next click, please. And this was the messy uh, palette for that. Um, nobody wants to use that. Yeah? But, uh, well, speaking of that, Devin is not here. You could also quick drop that off if you knew how to do it. You all the names. So, yeah, developer experience. Uh, let's better on top about that. This is the new VI tree. So I've reduced the number of VIs using the polymorphic VIs to just it's not, not even too handful of this And this is a nice big palette. Although palettes are not my best friends, I hate to configure them. I find the way uh, you have to configure them um, unintuitive, but you know, that there's still this, this, this legacy VI thing. Now let's get to the guinea pig part. What's about that? So um, the challenge for me was to do this refactoring, and I wanted to uh, know how long it really takes me. My basic plan was to just to kind of lock myself into my office for several days, and then just, yeah, you know, you can just go with the flow, no, dis uh, no, no, no disturbances, and stuff like that. As you can imagine, things like that don't work out. So, um, yeah. Uh, I had to go with um, I had to go uh, on several uh, on several yeah, labs. But before implementing the DQMH module, so I'm sorry, I have to mention I'm talking about the DQMH module right now, yeah? not not so much about the architecture, but the DQMH module itself. So basically, the stuff that Fabiola, hi Fabiola, um, that stuff that uh, Fabiola is really, really interested in. Uh, before. I was really excited to code and try try to cover those um, BI scripting and all this uh, assistance. But before I had to sit down and just and just think about how do I want to um, really to, to configure or to implement this DQMH module because I had to handle those DLL callbacks, those user events that are fired by the DLR. And just to show you, this is my way. I'm an old-fashioned guy. This is my way of doing. I still have a notebook, I still have a pen, I know how to shop with a pen, I know how to draw. Yeah. Yes, so, no. I'm doing UML pro, um, diagrams with the UL, UML design, but still, if it comes down to scripting and to planning, I'm still using that. And this is what I finally came up with. So, this is a screenshot from the main BI for, of, of the DQMH module. You can see here the event handling loop, this is a message handling loop, and the uh, solution I came up with was to use the helper loop. This helper loop is encapsulated into a sub VI just to clean up the code. Because if I have to put that in there, this is anywhere. This this is bigger than one, one screen size, so um, I wanted to uh, to keep it as clear as possible. Especially since last year we were talking about clean code, yeah, and I tried to do it. So, uh, so going back, please. Um, this is just just to show you. This is the event registration for the for the helper loop. In case um, you need to check that out any further. <coughs> so this is the helper loop itself. So the sub VI that the, the, the helper loop uh, uh, the helper loop that the sub uh, sub VI contains. Um, basically, just dynamic user events. Um, an event comes in, something is done. We have a constant vari uh, uh, variant table up here, up there. Don't have set on, uh, set maps right sets and maps now because I'm still uh, working on 2017. We could have done with that uh, new data types if they had been available. Nothing very spectacular about that. If you're interested, further information, the help loop, just um, Google go to datacore.com or, or just 
Google data quadrant column DQMH actress should be the first um, the first thing that comes up in Google or humpinsoft.com because that was a uh, blog uh, entry by your account. Um, <coughs> short discourse, talking about clean code on how to keep your block diagram uh, clean. What I did, decision for me, during this, um, yeah, during, during this uh, implementation was that I am introducing what I call execution BIs. So I don't want to call uh, code all the stuff I'm doing for the message processing somewhere in there. Instead, I'm putting it into an execution BI. This execution BI has inputs and outputs for the state data, has inputs and outputs for the data it needs to process and the process data. So this way I was able to keep it kind of clean. Yeah, you could do it. Yeah. But that's that's the that's the caveat to that. The problem is um, if this type definition grows, all those uh, front panels of this execution EIs, they get messy. No problem with LabVIEW 2019, you just go inside and do a uh, front panel cleanup. But once again, no 2019 available one. It's still not. But this is uh, let's say this is a caveat I accepted. These are low-level VIs. I probably don't have to uh, take a look into them again, so it's a kind of trade-off. Okay. So that's for the technical things. The really important thing for me was now how long did it really take? And since I told you, just yeah, yeah, ah, what's okay. Um, so this was my, again, my old-fashioned, good old-fashioned way of documenting what, what I did, because as soon as I had 10 minutes time or half an hour time during my day, I just took out my notebook, started doing some, some things, put down the notes, um, noted the times, and you see, sometimes I'm getting quite creative. Yeah. Light bulbs and check marks and colors and frames and stuff like that. Now, I've really just found this is, for me, this is a way I really, uh, I'm kind of motivated to, to go back into my notes that I've taken and, and look into that. Because if I'm scribbling something down and can't read it anymore, I'm not going to use them again. So that's clean, handwritten documentation, whatever you want to call it. So, back to the guinea pig. This whole thing cost me architectural stuff, Scripting, learn, learn, get into the scripting stuff. What else did I have? I, had to, um, I could reuse parts of the AF based stuff, so the DLL interface. I am not a fast WebView programmer. I am still getting used to Quick Drop. Yeah. And what else do we have? Um, use, using DQMH 4.1. 4.2 has uh, better features for, for the reply message. So, given that all, it took me some. 44 hours to get the whole stuff like it is. Of those 44 hours, it was eight hours for DQMH, and there are several reiteration loops in there. So for me, this, this was the outcome I was interested in. For me, these 44 hours were okay. They might not be in your situation, but for me, the um, the, the benefit of having the, the better user interface and having more stable stuff uh, was really worth that effort. So, so what, what I basically did, I came just to get into this wording. This is where I came, was where I come from. Yeah, I just took the body parts from the, the, that could be reused from the, from the student's project, put them together to, to Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. <coughs> And now it's still woody parts, but they're assembled to, uh, say, to, uh, to a, a little bit Herman's, Herman monster. They are, uh, yeah, at least we can smile now, so. <laughs> okay. Any questions to the three of us? Well, you're all set to go. Which is fine, what the presenter in the last slot said. If a question for the first presenter. Yeah, uh, yeah. How long have you been using the like Frankenstein code or like the zombie code tool? Uh, how long have you been using that? 
Uh, so to repeat the question just so everyone hears, how long have I been using that? Uh, about six months. Okay. So I inherited a project, a large part of what I get is um, people start working on their code, then they, um, they call me when they get to this big ball of mess and they're not quite sure what to do. And so I inherited this project that was started back in 2014, 2013. They wanted to adopt it to this, adapt it to this new project. And I started realizing like, I'm doing a lot of the same stuff over and over when we're looking at old code and trying to go to new code and trying to <coughs> adapt whatever they were doing to the, to like my style and, and sort of my way of doing things. And this sort of just kind of fell out of that. And I had been thinking about the, that presentation since 2014, since so seeing that. So like, I can't really apply it directly to LabVIEW at the time when I saw it. And so then all of a sudden it just kind of clicked. And I was like, hey, I could do this. And then I started learning a little bit more about VI scripting and I started just put that all together and it just kind of fell out from there. And it works really well with, um, if you are using version control. So I didn't get a chance to mention that. but. Uh, whenever you go and bury that corpse and you're done with that code, that's an excellent time to commit that code so you have a breakpoint there. And uh, I'm also in the process of coming up with some other features to eventually add to it. Because uh, I think there might be some ways to hook into some of the version control stuff and then some other things. So it's kind of the start of it. Go ahead and then you. Okay. Yes, I do Disable structure on the outside of the submit and instead of just burying it inside the submit, so we have a different function to still use your book. So the question was why did I wrap the sub VI uh, with the with the diagram disabled structure of the gravesite on the main VI as opposed to inside the sub -VI? And the reason for that is I'm refactoring the main VI and I wanted to keep what was originally there to begin with so I can flip back and forth. But I can easily go into that sub VI and do and put a great site inside the sub VI too. And then the bookmark manager will pick that up as well. So I sort of, um, it's a way to also tag or sort of bookmark and keep track of where I'm at in my refactoring from the top level all the way down to whatever sub VI is I'm putting in. Uh, what were you saying about your, your own bookmark manager? Yeah, so in 2015, Lavi 2015, you can create your own custom bookmark manager. And so there's a, um, there's a forum post, I think it's by Darren, that uh, has an example of how basically the LabVIEW version one is. You can basically just copy and paste that one and then modify it to your own means. And so you can actually create whatever kind of interface you want. And there's an example that shows like you can actually put the block diagram of your VIs, like a little panel off to the side, and I used that and adapted that for my specific use. So, do you use your uh, refactoring bookmark tool in conjunction with uh, your source controls, which is how you, people would normally do it? Like, you change the VI or change the file, and you type a comment in, and you always go back and compare and pull the other. Yes, yeah, it's a combination. I sort of think about it from a, there's the version controls, the macro level, and then the, this is sort of the like micro level or at that VI. If, if you think about it from like you're using Subversion, for example, and you make that change, you do the delete all, you hit the button. Now, what do you want to do when you want to see the old implementation? You got to branch it, you got to pre check it out, you got to do all this sort of stuff, pull it up in another project, make sure you don't cross link anything when you do all of this, all this sort of stuff. Whereas with this, I can just flip. Right, I could just go to the other one and see it right there. So I, I view it as, a, as it's not replacing it, it's sort of an extension or it's, it's working in conjunction with it. So at what point do you check in your zombified code here? You're, I yeah. forget the term, but you know, so you've, <laughs> made, you've made a temporary change. Yes. And, and obviously your boss is using it, so you've <coughs> sort of released it. So at what point do you actually check it into your SDN and actually version it? Right, so when the question was, when do I actually commit the code to the version control? Um, basically, anytime I make a modification, I'm sort of, um, I view commits as being very quick, in my opinion, so I do it all the time. So as soon as I flip back to the zombie, I know I have a timestamp in there, but um, I do a commit there. And then I usually have an automated build sort of set up so that I make the change, I hit the button, and it just sends out the new release with that being in there. When the bookmark manager in the graveyard, I can also do all of them. I can select all of my all of my corpses, all of my stuff, and basically create the zombie apocalypse and just hit go. 
and they will all become zombies then. So um, at any point I do that kind of level of change, I commit it to the, the reversion. And I usually type like, I create zombies. So it's the, part of the reason I use the metaphor and the naming is because it's a lot more fun to do that. Like going back in the, the logs, it's a lot more fun to say, oh, I killed 17 zombies today. So. Any other questions? Uh, maybe for Holly. Uh, so it looks like you created something that's like much easier to use. How much time do you anticipate that your other people will save just based on, like it looks like you take easily a couple of days to learn the old thing. Now you don't have to. Um, so, so, so the question is um, the, the productivity gain for the uh, for the users of, of the driver? Right. Uh, yeah, I expect it to be quite high because um, what, what I've seen with the beta uh, users, they want this also not so good documentation on for, for the devices themselves, so where to read, which address to read the objects and stuff like that, and at least there's um, a step less to take for them, just if they place just one BI and they can just configure it, and um, yeah, it's it's for far more convenient also for me. And I've had colleagues that keep teasing me and I want to have that, I want to have that. I said, let them get that before I come on from Austin. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for, for joining us and safe travels.